This is what we call the afterburn. And so if you are here and you'd like to make a comment or ask a question, you can line up. I see we've got people lined up already. If you're on live stream, Rob will take care of the live stream comments and questions. We'll try to alternate two or three of each as we go back and forth. I'll start with the people here to give Rob some time to make note of the people over there. All right, Rocky, you're, on, you're up first. I'm so nervous, this is ridiculous. So. You started it out right there. Well, that's, that's understandable since this is the first time you've come up on the mic. and everything. It feels like it. <laughs> I'm all dressed in black because I'm in mourning. I'm mikvahed in my heart, and I'm dying to myself. There you go. Yeah. So, thank Good. you. Thank you. So you started out in Ephesians, and that three through five, it, started, it talked about the physical things that we would do to disqualify ourselves, disqualify ourselves for the inheritance. Basically the fornication and what, you know, what have you. I mean. So, happen to look up his word, belief. Belief means physically right, firm, permanent. So I'm, I'm supposed to walk in this physically right. So I got up this morning when I started to get dressed. I put on, I put on my dum-dum strings. Remind me to keep the commandments. <laughs> you know, I physically put them on. You know, I physically came here. You know, that this is what I'm supposed to do. This is right. You know, I'm physically not going to do Christmas this year because I know that's that's not the right thing to do. So what it's worth. I just thought I'd share that. Okay, I mean, appreciate that. Okay. So. So what he's trying to say is that he's recognizing that, you know, these things that we do, I physically choose to eat or not eat certain foods. I physically chose, he said, to put on, he called them his dumb dumb strings, the seat seat to remind us not to be dumb, okay? All right, so he has them so he can grab a hold of them. Okay, he physically showed up here. So, you know, you, you have this, this walking it out. Intellectualizing it means nothing until you do it. You have to do it. Craig. Yes, in Ephesians, um, goes on to say that what, um, before the empty words, that do not just be deceived by empty words, um, they all seem, you know, really serious and would probably be pretty easy for all of us to say, especially on a Shabbat morning, um, that we don't do any of this stuff. Um, is it more simple? Um, can we deceive ourselves by looking at um, an area that we do well in and thinking that the Father blesses us for our efforts in an area that we um, do well in while we're either completely blind or choose to be blind to areas that we need to work on. Can it be a false word for me to stand up here and say that Abba blesses me because of this, 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 and this that I do as opposed to he blesses me because he sees fit to bless me, not because I do one particular area right, and then can that lead into a, um, it's a leadership situation where uh, a half-truth or you know, not the whole testimony is being heard by people, and instead of um, giving honor and glory to Yeshua for being there for us, the only way that we can receive favor, um, we end up putting a lot of that either on to our efforts or onto efforts of other people. And it can be um, deceitful in ways that um, I, we all need a drastic amount of help to, at least I do, to see that within myself. Um, all does it take somebody just to say that a right word in a conversation, and my mind is completely off of Shabbat, away from the Father, and it's, it's really hard to keep, it's a short period of time, but to really keep focused on the Father, I find it to be extremely difficult, and it just seemed to tie into the foolish words. So Amen. More so than... Amen. I agree. And, you know, it, you know keeping, keeping Shabbat and focused for the whole 24 hours, it does seem like a relatively short period of time, but on the same, on the same token, it still takes our, our focus for that period of time. 
We're, we, to some degree, we're all ADD. We can't keep focus for very long, okay? Um, those who actually diagnose that way have a lot more difficulty with it, but we all have challenges keeping focus just for one day. That's not even a whole day. You sleep part of it, and we still have a, a challenge, you know, staying focused. But I think that, you know, I really appreciate what you said, Craig, in terms of do not, and I'm going to say this as an encouragement, please do not think that you know why you're being blessed in terms of specific action. You can understand that you're being blessed if you're being blessed. Sometimes it's time and chance and things just work out for you and it has nothing to do with him blessing you. He's just allowed you to have a blessing. But it's the effort heading in a direction that is what's bringing blessing. It's not because I did this thing and so I received a blessing for this one piece. He's not looking at you in terms of one piece. He may be pleased that you're adding a piece of the puzzle and doing it. It may allow certain things to happen and to benefit you in your life because of that. But I'd be very hard pressed to think there's a, a value and not maybe more of a negative. And you're thinking, I've been blessed because I'm keeping Shabbat now. The rest of my life's a mess, but I'm keeping Shabbat now. Well, he may allow certain blessing to encourage you in your keeping of Shabbat, but I wouldn't go as far as. So I like that he said that, you know, I'm being blessed because Yahweh has seen fit to bless me for my overall efforts in the right direction as opposed to a specific action, okay? All right, so yes, he's blessing you for maybe you're going in the right direction and moving that little bit forward as opposed to, I did this one thing, and that's you know, a, a direct correlation. I think that sets you up for problems if you do that. And that's why um, we don't, I mean, as believers, we don't follow the money and and see that as the ultimate sign on his word and his, um, his anointing. Because all that material stuff is, it's easily faked. It's, it, it doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's where, his, where his hand is. And it's just, you know, I think as a, as a, a congregation and throughout scripture, the collective consciousness of the group is, is um, you know, something that, that, that leadership has got to struggle with. As a congregation member, it can be hard to, to know where to add in, and, and it's, it's just really hard to, to keep focused. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, um, I've often given the example of you're, you're sowing and you're sowing, and you want to reap right where you sowed, as opposed to the giant harvest behind you that you're not seeing because you, you're so set on reaping exactly where you sowed. You're gonna reap because you sowed, and you're gonna reap what you need, not necessarily what you think you want. Now, if you need financial help, you may reap financial help. But also recognize that that's a trap if you're not careful, because some of you may be praying for a better income, a better job, and then one comes available, and you believe that Yahweh provided it, but then that job requires Saturday work, and then you have to know that didn't come from Yahweh, but he allowed it to see how you handle it. Will you be tempted by what looks like a, well, obviously Yahweh knew I needed the money, so he gave me this job, and he knows it's on Saturday, but, but he gave it to me. No, he allowed you to be tempted by it. He's not gonna give you something that goes against his word. And so you gotta be careful with that, absolutely. All right, Taylor. Hi, Rabbi. Hi. Um, I had like four, four questions and then some of them are comments. Okay, so I wanted to see if I had the right thought process with this. When you were talking about Paul and Timothy and you were saying how he was a strong speaker like you were and he wasn't all soft and beat around the bush and all that stuff. So I was thinking, what's it called? The Millennium and the kingdom, that, that teaching. So in my head, I used to think of Yeshua as this like long haired white man that was sweet and was surrounded by children, all that stuff. Um, and, and so the verse, I don't know if I'm connecting it wrong, the verse that I never understood the verse where it says he speaks with authority Mm -hmm. So is that around the same, like, when Yeshua does come back for that kind of stuff, will he, like, will that, will he be like a strong teacher like you are? Oh, no, much worse. <laughs> much stronger. Okay, so the verse you're talking about is the verse where it says that they recognized 
that he didn't sound like everybody else. He spoke like someone actually bearing authority, okay? And, you know, I, I think when you picture Yeshua, you, you shouldn't be picturing the one in the movies that almost is always a very, very soft, very, you know, dainty almost type of a, of a guy. I think that, you know, he was a carpenter, okay? And, you know, in those days, the, the physical labor, I'm sure he was a very, you know, masculine looking and very strong figure. Not the kind of figure that would just stand out in the crowd necessarily, because everybody else is working hard and doing these things. Because remember, he blended in with everybody. And so, but when he taught, and when he taught, I mean, we talked, and when he taught, there was a strength of authority. Look, I think one of the reasons why you all appreciate the teachings I do is because you know it's coming from a place of 100% conviction about what I'm saying. And that strength comes through in the teaching. And that's what Paul does, and Peter does, and Yeshua did, and James does. In all of these writings, you can hear the strength of their conviction and belief in what they're saying. And they're also not afraid to say what needs to be said. And so when Yeshua is sitting on the throne, I'm sure it's going to be the strongest and the most straightforward that we've ever heard anybody be. Okay, not in a harsh way, but with the strength of knowing more than any human being can know that he's right and that what he's giving you is what's right, okay? And then kind of connected to that, what you said when you always like those little comments about like the other teachers in the messianic movement and stuff. So like, I was just wondering this, like, are you like, is, did God set this up as like you being like Moshe and there's nobody else who's like able to teach like you do? Is that like? Look, that's, that's, that's not a question that I really would like to entertain that way. But look, okay. um, I already have a reputation out there where people think that I'm beyond arrogant and some other things. But look. <laughs> I don't know other people that teach like I do. I'd like to find them. I, that's why I'm on the internet looking all the time, okay? So I don't know what that position is yet. I know what he's using me to do right now. He has me teaching you guys here. He has me helping congregations around the world in the, in the platform called MTOI, okay? Um, and and at, at some point, whatever that plays out to be, it plays out to be. I just find myself frustrated not having the peers that I can sit there and lock elbows with, so to speak, and, and, and lock arms with and know that we're walking in the same direction. Because the, most of the people that I know and all the teachers that I listen to, they're, they're just not ready to be delivering a message of that strength. And so either because they don't believe it that way or because they want to make this um, as inoffensive to people as they can. Which is why when I've been at the few conferences that I've actually been at, you know, there, I watch teachers absolutely refuse to answer questions or give a politician type answer, which is answering the question without answering the question. Because it's, it would be on questions and topics where the person's question could, if they answered it the way they should, could offend somebody or could step on a toe or two. And that was really frustrating and disappointing to me. I don't know if it's so much frustrating, it was very disappointing. Now, of course, I happened to be there, so I was able to just take the mic and answer the questions. But it, it, just, it just surprised me on some levels and didn't on others, the reluctance to deal with real questions and real issues in a real way. And I don't know if it's because too many of these teachers are relying on, in their mind, the money coming from these people. And so they see each person as a, as a donor that if I offend them, I might not get their donations anymore. Um, look, I teach the way I teach and we don't have any financial issues. So apparently that's not the point, okay? ABBA inspires enough people to send funds in this direction to do the things we're doing, even with the way I teach. So apparently that's not the end all be all to this. As a matter of fact, most of it comes in because people like that I'm not sugarcoating it, I'm not beating around the bush, and I'm just straightforward and that's what you get. And so 
Unfortunately, there's not a lot of teachers out there doing that. I haven't found any, really. I mean, they'll be very straight on the few issues that they think are important, but they just will do it in very small and targeted ways. They won't cover all the gamut. They won't take questions like I do and just open up to, th you know, in general. They just don't do that kind of thing. And, and um, because if I take your question, if I have an answer, I'm going to give the answer. If I don't, I tell you I don't. I'm not going to give you some beat around the bush non-answer. Or I'm not going to worry about how you're going to respond to the answer I give. So there are people that will say things like, well, you know, look, there's only one Moses, okay? And, and, and he was bringing a people out of a nation, a nation out of a nation. However, there have been over time periods, a teacher that's brought out that then is given an opportunity to train up other teachers. And that's a role that I have. Am I the only one with that role? I would love to think that's not the case. I just haven't found, I mean, there may be guys out there doing a great job that just aren't on YouTube and don't have videos of what they're doing. And so, you know, I don't know. People, people often will send me links to saying, oh, this guy's just like you. No, okay? And, and it's not a pride and a vanity thing. I listen and I'm like, well, how, you know, maybe the accent's similar, they're from New York or something. <laughs> There's a guy down, you know, not too far from here that's from New York and has an accent like mine, a little bit, I guess. Uh, I think he talks a little bit more like he's from New York, you know, <laughs> than I do on a regular basis. But other than that, there's nothing he teaches that I teach that are similar, really, except for the basic mechanics, okay? But positionally, doctrinally, and understanding-wise, it's very Messianic Jewish sort of MJAA sort of focus. Um, and so I don't really know how to answer that question until it all just plays out however it's going to play out. I'm just doing what I have to do the best I can do it. You guys see me however you see me is really the best way I can answer that. I, I can't assume, he hasn't like told me, by the way, you're, and I haven't seen a burning anything, okay? <laughs> you know, and all that kind of stuff. So no, but I have a role to play. And I may be more of a role like a John, you know, the immerser to just be crying aloud in the wilderness to prepare a way. And so I'm just trying to do that sort of wake up, you know, repent, get your life straight sort of thing. So maybe more in those lines, but we'll have to see how it plays out. But I appreciate the question. And, and, I, and I, I, if you find anybody out there, then please let me know. I'd love to meet with them and work together and that kind of thing if they're, they're out there. But, you know, it's hard. Okay, next. All right. The next are two comments. Um, the verse, I didn't write down the number, but the, when it said, see then you walk exactly not as unwise, but wise, redeeming the time because the days are wicked. I love this verse so much. Um, and throughout scripture, I see them everywhere, you know, like redeem the time, redeem the time, because you don't have like enough time. So it reminds me like, okay, Taylor, Get off your butt and start doing things right, you know? I mean, um, that's verse 15 and 16 of chapter 5 of Ephesians. Mm. And, but I can be honest, sometimes I'm like, I think that I have to like, and, and when I was even in my old church, I always, I was like, a, I always put like one extra step. Like I didn't think I could have like fun or hang out with people. I always thought like, oh no. Like, I'm not redeeming the time. Like, I'm not about to have fun. Like, I'm about to go do whatever I got to do. And that was, like, spreading the gospel and all that stuff. But um, that's what was in my mind when that happened. So, um, and the next thing you mentioned um, at the end of somebody's question or at the end of your teaching, um, you said that people in the church said that you couldn't lose your salvation. And I remember a long time ago in church, they always said, or no, you said that they couldn't, they said you couldn't sin. And they did tell me that I, they told me I could sin, but I remember being at a camp, my camp, and I would, I asked them, and I was reading the Bible like crazy. And I asked them, I said, okay, how do, can I lose my salvation? Like, can y'all explain that to me? And they said, well, you can't lose it but you also got to put in work. So I was like, okay, 
there's like gray area here and I, I don't I don't really understand this. So I should have I should have gotten a hint and I, I wish that God would have led me to you in that way, but it didn't happen. But well, I you're here now. <laughs> yes. Well, you're here now. And I'm thankful. So Yeah. All right. So let me let me address the redeeming the time thing first. Think think of it this way. I had a thought that hit me while Taylor was talking, which is you know how some of you will say something like, well, I'm going to start my diet August 1st, whatever, sometime in the future, or I'm going to start exercising next week, or I'm going to, redeeming the time means do it now, okay? Stop putting off what needs to be done. I'm not talking about the diet and the exercise, although you should not put those off either. I'm talking about the, all of the things about your walk. Stop putting it off like, well, I'll start after tabernacles. I'll, I'll do it in time for trumpets. Or I'll do, no, start now, Okay? That's what redeeming the time is. Stop wasting the time, letting time just fly by, because you don't have as much time as you think you do, okay? You don't know how much time you have. And I'm sure, I promise you, it's not as much as you think. Even if you think you're gonna live to be 100, you keep putting things off, you're still gonna get to 100 thinking you didn't have enough time. So you don't have as much as you think. So stop wasting it and get, get forward. Um, the thing about... Um, the whole salvation thing that uh, Taylor was mentioning, how they'll say, well, but you have to still do works in this. This is the problem in all the messianic teachers as well as the Christian teachers. They know, but they don't understand how stupid it sounds when they try to do this. They know that you need to believe, at least that's in their minds, that you have to believe you're saved, but they also know that somehow you still need to do something, but yet they want you to, so they can't communicate that without sounding like idiots. And I don't mean that to be insulting. I mean, you sound like a, like a confused fool trying to, and listen to a Messianic teacher try to tell you that you have to keep the Torah without telling you you have to keep the Torah. That's what they'll all do. They will never tell you you have to do it, but they want to tell you you have to do it. But yet, if you're saved by grace and not works in the way they understand that, then they feel like they can't tell you you have to do it. So they'll tell you things like, well, we get to do it. Well, that's true that you get to do it. If you want a covenant, you get to do it. But if you're gonna covenant, you have to do it. And I'm one of the only teachers out there that's gonna tell you, you have to do it. And that's the difference. I mean, that's one of the big differences between what I say and what a lot of these other guys say. Because if you ask them about, do you have to keep the Torah, they will give you one of those answers that make no sense. Because you can't say you have to, but you don't have to in the same sentence. And that's what they believe, though. They believe that you don't have to, but they also believe that you're supposed to. But supposed to is not have to. And so it sounds dumb when they say it, and you can't understand it, okay? And I used to wrestle with that. When I first started teaching, I came from the same place as everybody else, believing grace was unmerited favor and blah, 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 blah. And to try to explain all of that never worked. It always sounded like I sounded like an idiot. Because it, it, you can't make sense with that. But when you understand grace, the way I teach it to you and the way it was shown to me in the teaching on that, and you understand salvation in the way that I showed you that in the teaching on that, it all makes sense. It all fits exactly perfectly without any issue, without confusion or anything. Amen. Okay? And that's the difference. And I wish these other guys out there would embrace it. But they can't because of the verse we talked about, and Peter talks about putting off the old guy, right? You gotta put off that old man still thinking like the old man. Well, that old man thinking is that Christianity thinking of, oh no, Yeshua did it all. It's his righteousness that matters, not ours. And that's true, but it's not. Your righteousness gets you where you need to go, and only that far, but you still need to have it to get that far. He then comes in after that. The way I pictured it and gave it to you was, your righteousness gets you to the kingdom door, metaphorically, right? But the door is locked. His righteousness unlocks the door. But yours got you to the door. If you don't have yours, you never get to the door. Okay? That doesn't minimize his. Yours is of no use without his. You get to the door and you're stuck. There's nothing to do. Without his, you can't get in. Without yours, you don't even get to the door. 
Doesn't that make any sense? It's simple. But yet, when you listen to people teach, and I get to hear this all the time when I listen to people ask these questions, I watch these teachers bend themselves in an un into an unintelligible pretzel trying to explain that they want you to know that you're supposed to do these things, but they can't, they can't get the words out that you have to do it, that it's required for covenant, that it's a mandate, it's not an option. Covenanting is the option. Whether or not you covenant, that's an option. If you covenant, obedience is not an option. It's an obligation. And there's very few people out there that I've heard teach Torah that say that the way I just said that. They want to tell you that it's something you are, it's okay, it's good to do, it's supposed to do it, but if you don't do it, don't worry about it. No. That's, those are the empty words that bear no fruit. And you go listen to everybody out there and tell me if you hear anybody saying that. Nobody's saying that. And that's, that's scary. I mean, that's, that's unfortunate. They're afraid to tell you that you are obligated in covenant to do this stuff. Obligated. You have, that's a voluntary obligation. You chose to covenant. So you voluntarily obligated yourself into this. But covenant requires you to obey, and it requires him to bless you with the eternal life and everything. He, he obligated himself to you if you do your part. That was the agreement at Sinai. It's the same agreement today. He will take you as his people. He will bless you with eternal life. You obey and trust him in full belief that doing what he says will bring all the things he says it will bring. Amen? Amen. You're going to wait a second, and we're going to go to live stream. Okay, from, I see, a comment from Ben, Cal ben Callender. He says, the reason Peter needs to stir us up to remembrance is the same reason we need personal trainers and dietitians. We need coaches, or we tend to fall away from our goals. For Yanni, a question, 2 Peter 1, verse 9, cleanse from old sin. Is this sins against Yahweh only, or is it sins against man as well? Well, I mean, look, I, I think it's more the way I explained it, that you're going to do things you shouldn't do, which is sin. Because remember, sin is if you're a covenanted person doing what you shouldn't do. If the old you is still making decisions instead of the new you. That's what it's talking about. Okay? You have to think like Messiah now, not like you. Your way of thinking got you where you were before. His way of thinking is going to get you into the kingdom. Next. Um, from Tammy Cartwright, is it appropriate to reflect on phases of your life using 2 Peter 1, verse 5 through 7? Right now, I feel like I feel I'm in a part of my life where I should be focusing on reverence. Are there different phases in one's life where one might be working on these traits at different times in different ways? Yes. Okay. There are going to be times when you're working on different aspects of this that you're struggling with. And some of the aspects, look, you should have gone through all of them to a certain degree, but you have, think of it like a chain of actions. There are some weak links in that chain. You're going to have to go spend time focused on the weak links. All of you have gone through the whole process to some degree. Okay. All the way from the beginning with uprightness all the way down to love. But you have some weaknesses in some of those steps, and you have to go spend time focusing on maybe one step more than the others so that you can get that fixed as you're working on the whole process. All right, next. Okay, from Anna Uden, can you expand on, on the... Okay, can you expand on the, the law is not made for a righteous, righteous man in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 1, 9? Seems a thing main, mainstream would skew to a point where they would say we don't need Torah. All right, I think I covered that in the teaching. You may need to go back and listen to it again. Um, but I'll explain it again. Basically, if we were all righteous, we wouldn't need a law to tell us what to do because we'd already be doing it. So it's not that we wouldn't need the law. In other words, we could just do whatever we want. If we were righteous, we wouldn't need a law to tell us not to murder. We wouldn't murder. 
We wouldn't need a law to tell us not to steal. We wouldn't steal. We wouldn't need a law to tell us not to do idolatry. We wouldn't do idolatry. We wouldn't need a law. In other words, all those things we wouldn't need the law for. Okay? But the law was there to help us to understand what is right and what is wrong. And we were already in the place called wrong. And so we need the law to show us how to change from what was wrong to what is right. Of course, Christianity likes to use these things to have empty words to tell you that these things were done away with unnecessary and you don't need to do them. Or even worse, they tell you it's wrong to do them. They literally tell you it's wrong to do them. That somehow it's sin to try to keep the law. There's nothing but insanity out there. But the thing is, that's how you have to understand this delusion bubble that the Father allowed you to be in. You believed all that because the insanity was something you couldn't realize was insanity. That's how you know the Bible's true, by the way, because when he popped your bubble, all of a sudden you were like, oh, whoa. I mean, it just was a mind-blowing type of thing. And that proves us to a certain degree your Bible to be accurate. You know, people look for all kinds of proof whether or not the word is accurate. Is there another way to explain why you saw what you saw, believed it fully, couldn't understand anything else, people came to you about the law and you said, you guys are crazy, it's been done away with, blah, blah, blah. All, how many of you had Torah observant people come to you and you told them to take a hike at some point in your life? Okay? You just didn't want to hear it, you thought they were wrong. There's a lot of you out there because you weren't ready. You couldn't see it. Somebody showed you Shabbat, you couldn't see it. Someone showed you Kashrut, you couldn't see it. Then all of a sudden he went pop, and now you could see it, it's all there. Your book tells you that that's reality. Reality is that you went from a delusion into the awakening of the, of the real, of reality. And so that is a real experience. Problem is, the people out there who are still in that false reality, that, that delusional space, they believe very genuinely that they're in reality. And you can't change that. Only he can, like he did to you. All right, one more, and then we'll go to the people here again. Just hearing this, and it just brought to remembrance here, I was just looking that up. Would would that be kind of what Yeshua is talking about in Luke 5, 32? Yes. Okay, so Luke 5, 32 says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Well, think about it. If you're righteous, what do you need to repent of? Okay, so he's calling those that are sinning to repent. Of course, you fall short in sin, and then you need to repent. Okay, so the law is not for the righteous, not because it doesn't apply to them. It's because they're applying it. Oh, that's good. Let me say that again. The law, it's not that the law doesn't apply to the righteous. It's that they're already applying it. Because that's what they'll say as Christians. Well, we don't need the law because we're righteous, because we're righteous through Messiah. Well, no, only if you're doing the law doesn't apply. In other words, you don't need to know that the law exists if you're applying it. You know what? I very rarely, if ever, refer back to the law to figure out what to do because I've already learned it. And I apply it. When you're brand new, you ask a lot of questions like, what are the, when are those feasts again? What are they called? When do they come up? What do I eat? What's clean? What's unclean? I don't really ever go to Leviticus 11 anymore to figure out the laws of Kashrut. That law still applies to me but I don't need to go look at it because I've already started applying it for so long that I know the law. I don't need to remember about fins and scales or choose its cut and, and divided hoof and whatever else is in there. I already have walked this out to the point where I don't need to refer to it all the time. Okay? It'd be like when you first were starting to drive, your teacher, I'm sure, told you Check your mirrors, check this thing, make sure that you look both ways before the streets, whatever it is, you were told all these things. But you don't need that anymore. You've been driving for 10, 15, 20 years, and you know, and automatically, without thinking, look at your mirrors and do all these other things. 
In the beginning, you had to think to look up at your mirror, look to the side mirror. You had to look. You had to think about it. Now you do it, you don't even realize you're doing it. As a matter of fact, you drive from work to home and don't even remember doing it. But you made all the turns and did all the things that you did all the way home and don't even remember it because you did it automatically. It's now part of you. Well, when the law is part of you, you don't need to be thinking about it a whole lot. Now, we wear seat seat, you know, to remind us, you know, to keep the law. But the seat seat don't have a bunch of the laws written on them or anything so that we have to look at it and read them. It says, you know the law, remember to do it. So hopefully that answered that question. Good, good comment, uh, Rob. Okay, uh, Brianna. I'm sure if you were actually righteous, you wouldn't think of yourself as righteous. You just would be doing like, like what you said, it would just be something that you just do. Yeah. Because I could not just think of myself like, oh, I'm righteous. Because I feel like that's just so. Yeah, see, I, I think the point, the point is, is well made that when we start to label things, we think we've arrived. Like the idea of being saved, being righteous, being, it's an arrival point instead of a goal, a journey. Salvation is a journey in terms of enjoying the salvation that's being offered to us. Being saved, theoretically everybody's been saved. He died and was resurrected, provided salvation to everybody. Whether you actually get to enjoy the reward that comes because salvation has been made available so that you can live, that, that's a journey. But if you say, I'm righteous, you've arrived at something. It's a finishing. And see, the, the Christianity wants to say that Yeshua is the finisher of the work. Well, that's true, but not of the work you need to do. He's the author and finisher, right? Well, that's the goal. Do what he did to the end when he died and was resurrected. You'll end up in the same type of, you know, relationship that he did. You'll have kingdom entry. All right, Brianna? Also, you can think of it as like a person who speaks Spanish isn't going to need Spanish one because they speak Spanish, but someone who speaks English is going to need Spanish one if they want to learn Spanish. Right. In other words, you're not going to keep needing instruction if you already have that as part of you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Ephesians 5 chapter, the Ephesians 5 verse 12. Do you think that's referring to like Lashon Hara? Ephesians 5 12? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure that's part of it. It says, for it is a shame even to speak of what is done by them in secret. I mean, I think he's trying to say that there's some really, you know, unspeakable things that people are doing. But also, if we're speaking of them, that would fall into the category of Lashon Hara. We don't need to be speaking evil of anybody or sharing their shameful behaviors with people and that kind of thing. Okay, anything else? Okay, so, um, First Timothy... Five. Wait, sorry. First Timothy one. chapter one, verse um, five and six um, is to love from a clean heart, good conscience, and sincere belief. Uh, I was thinking of a in James chapter three. If you could connect um, what it says in verse seventeen. I don't know if that's right, but. James 3, 17 says, but the wisdom from above is first clean, then peaceable, gentle, ready to obey, filled with compassion, good fruits. Yes, this is James putting a, uh, another list together, okay. like the one in, 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 uh, in Timothy. Or actually, the, you know, the one in uh, Peter, actually. So it's a list like that, okay, mm -hmm. where he's, he's talking about these things. But I didn't really go into it too much, the idea of doing things with a clean heart, but a clean heart meaning without hypocrisy. In other words, without your own agendas, without any kind of deception in there, but genuinely open and, and receiving only what comes from above in your approach. Okay? Uh, and then I forgot to mention in Ephesians 5, when it talks about verse 14, of uh, wake up you who sleep, I almost think of it as like, that before you get called, you're like unconsciously walking in darkness, but then, then you have to choose. So you consciously make the choice, light or darkness. So like, if you're not doing anything to, like a Christian says not to do, then what's, you can't really differentiate if you're for someone walking in darkness or in light, because 
the, what you do is what differentiates it. I may. Well said. And that's it. Okay, good. All right, Janet. Yes, Rabbi, thank you. Um, I was, you know, the, when we were talking about First Timothy 1, 4, yeah, you were explaining that it's not about bloodline, but about your choice, right? Right. So, I, I don't know why, but I often, every time I see a Jewish person who are, you know, really Jewish and they're doing their thing and I don't know why, but I, I kind of feel like I don't fit in, right? Because I'm not Jewish, or at least I don't know if I am or not. I don't really care. It doesn't matter, right? What you teach us is your choice. But somehow I kind of feel like I want to be, right, P part of the bloodline. And uh, a lot of times I may even feel like I'm shortcoming sure, sure because I'm not. So I don't know if other, other people struggle with that, but maybe because I'm still new in my walk. So I wonder if you could say a little bit about that. Well, I guess um, we still have, and you know what, Paul addresses this in a couple of places. We have this sort of um, uh, self-image problem or insecurity about being you know, equal and co-heirs and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'd like you to receive something from our brothers in the Jewish community, which is the ones that are actively you know, like the Orthodox would be. Not, and by the way, I know a lot of Orthodox that they claim they're Orthodox, but they keep nothing. But I mean, when you look at the ones who are observant Orthodox Jews, their whole life is observance. That doesn't mean they don't do things they shouldn't do from time to time, but they, they have their whole life patterned around and their, all their behaviors and actions are patterned around a vertical awareness and, and a commitment to do those things from that point of view. And they've got methodologies and processes for every aspect of their life, including how they get dressed and which shoe they tie first and everything. Now, I'm not saying we ever need to go that far, but understand that the level of commitment and of a vertical awareness and connection is certainly something to be uh, applauded and appreciated that we could imitate that Focus, okay? And that interest in being focused in that way. And so, but don't, don't feel, and this is something that Paul tries to do in a lot of his letters, don't ever feel less than, okay? Yes, it's of the Jew first, because chronologically it was of the Jew first. Of At that point when Paul's talking about it, all of the early congregation members were from the Jewish community. When Yeshua came, that's really all he talked to. But just because it's of the Jew first doesn't mean that we're not all co-heirs. And that's what, you know, Paul talks about. And so don't ever feel less than. Now, of course, if you go to the MJAA congregations, they will make you feel less than. They will absolutely convince you that the Jew is at a higher level and you are a second-class citizen. And this is one of the very shameful and, quite frankly, disgusting things that they teach. And that's my opinion, and, you know. But here, you know, the way we have taught you in discovering your identity... Your identity comes out of covenant. It doesn't come out of bloodline. It doesn't come out of what your birth genealogy was. It comes from your choice. And once you choose, you are looked at like sons and daughters. Okay, as a matter of fact, when it talks about the prophecy where it talks about the eunuchs who keep my commandments and choose the covenant are given a name even greater than those who have bloodline just because they have bloodline, but it's the ones who actually choose to do in covenant, get the greater name. And believe me, I grew up in a Jewish community where most of the people I grew up with were basically secular Jews, meaning they were Jews culturally by birth and kept nothing, okay, my family included. And so I grew up mostly in and among Jews that kept nothing. I knew others that kept everything. I went to school with others. I had friends that were like that. But the bloodline didn't apparently accomplish anything if they keep nothing. I mean, my family didn't keep anything. Yeah, we would go to Shabbat services occasionally, a couple of times a year. We'd, we'd go to, to Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur services pretty much every year. But so it's like a Christmas and Easter Catholic showing up twice a year. I mean, so what? The rest of the year they're doing nothing. 
I mean, you guys know all the, you know, you're familiar with that sort of, you know, reference. Yeah. Okay, we had anything and everything in the house to eat. And so being Jewish availed nothing there, okay? Then I was called differently, and my eyes were opened, and then I chose, as Paul would say, to be grafted back in, having been sort of pruned off because we were doing nothing. And then I covenanted and started walking this out and keeping the commands in the context of Messiah. And so, as a matter of fact, I never kept the commands without the context of Messiah. Because without Messiah, I wasn't keeping anything. It was only when I came to understand Messiah that I started keeping the commands. Because that was the context that I was receiving it in. And so, you know, in 1986 is when I started that journey. All right? So that's a long time ago. And so my, my walk as a Torah observant, covenanted person in the context of Messiah, all came at the same time. Okay, I wasn't raised keeping this stuff. Now, I did go to Hebrew school. That was a cultural thing more than anything else. I learned to read Hebrew. I understand the language. I, I learned about the holy days, etc. I understood how to do the different prayers in the liturgy. I did all these things from a child all the way up to the bar mitzvah. I even did that. But none of it had anything, to, it all seemed like hypocrisy to me because my family who wanted me to do all that wasn't keeping any of the stuff I was learning. They weren't doing any of that. You go to my mother's house right now, I'm sure there's unclean things in the refrigerator. I mean, that's, because that's not their walk. That's not where she is, okay? Now, by the way, you talk about, my daughter was bringing out the whole point about righteousness and Torah observance and the law and things and some of the other questions. My mother keeps a lot of the law. She would never steal. She would never commit adultery. She would never murder, never do. I mean, there's a lot of, she's a, she's a very, very good woman from all worldly approaches, okay? And a lot of it matches up naturally with Torah observance. So you know a lot of people like that. You probably have a lot of family members who are great people. And they wouldn't do things that almost all of us would agree are wrong to do. So they don't need the law to tell them not to do those things. A lot of the laws you never would have thought of breaking either. So you didn't need that either. Some of you never would have thought to steal or commit adultery or murder or whatever it is. And so those laws didn't really have a big effect on you. You were already living that way. You just now knew that the creator had told you that it was the right way to walk. But well, you're already walking that way. So hopefully that, that, that makes some sense there. Janet? Do you know me a couple of things, Rabbi? Okay. For um, second Kifa, it's verse uh, five, six, seven, right? Okay. We had, you talk about the whole process. And so many times you tell us that we need to work on ourselves. And I'm just looking at the process, and it really is that. You know, we have to do our utmost. You have to work at the knowledge, at self-control, endurance, reverence. It's just amazing how well you, you're teaching us how to really do this because without working on ourselves, you said, you know, without you adding any of this, you can't add brotherly affection. And it, it's congruent with what a lot of what, you, you know, if you don't have that self, like strength, in, inner strength, it's going to be hard to connect and really love, get to that point where you can really embrace the other person that you have in the walk, walking with you. So I, I like... I mean... Yes. And oh, wait, wait, let me, let me address that. Look, and the situations come up where people might look at what we're doing here, they may look at something somewhere else and those kind of things, or you may look back to some of your church experiences and you may feel like there was more love there. Don't, don't be fooled or don't lie to yourself when you, because you, you, you know that a lot of it was fake, yep. a lot of it was phony, a lot of it was probably real too, but a lot of it was fake and phony. And you found out because as soon as things went a little sideways, you saw how much love there really wasn't there. Okay? If it's this love going through this process and you get there at the end of the process, it's the culmination of the process, then you have real love. Because people will say, well, I don't feel the love here. I don't know what you're looking for. Well, sounds like you scold a lot. That's love too, by the way. 
but it's, you're looking for a feeling. So if you're looking for a feeling, then it could be much more challenging as opposed to looking for love. Love is an action, it's not a feeling. You can have certain feelings when you're being treated with love, but a lot of times people will say, well, I just don't feel like there's love in this congregation. Well, I don't know what you're looking for. But we're all learning to love genuinely and fully. And that's a whole different, now other people, by the way, have come here and said they've never felt the level of love anywhere like they feel here, in a good way. Like this is, some people have said they've never felt love before, period, till they came here. That's good. Because they're getting proper love. And it's an action. But it's not the action that's just all about the warm fuzzies and just, you know, smiling and making you feel good. It's part of it. We should be helping people to feel good. But just understand that that's what part of the thing is, is that there are places out there that, oh yeah, on all, all surface appearances, it may seem like it's got more, but how much of it is actually real? I don't know. I'm not judging it. I'm simply saying my experience and yours too tells you that a lot of it may not be. It takes a little discernment to see what's real. And you find out what's real when things are not so easy. I got a lot of people came here, started attending here. They moved here because they love me as a teacher and you guys as a congregation. And that love did not get expressed in a conversation before leaving or a chance to fix the, whatever the problems are, any of those kind of things. So where was the love then? And all the harsh things being said as they leave. Is that love? So now they're going to go find someplace more loving and bring their form of love there. E. <laughs> Which is why I say it's better that some people leave so that we don't have that here. Okay? We don't need more of that in this building. Now, that's not saying I want people to leave. I'm just saying if that's the way they're going to be, they shouldn't be doing that here. If they want to fix that and come back, absolutely. Love everybody to come back. Okay, Shannon? Hi, um... This question, I think it's like two questions, but it's like in the same, same category. Because um, I, I know that the goal is to love Yahweh, your Elohim, with all of our heart, mind, and soul, and to love each other as, as um, you love yourself. And um, I remember I asked this question already to you when you first started the Love and Torah teaching. Like, how do we deal with, because um, I know you do these things, like you learn to practice self-discipline and endurance, and it's like going to um, do your utmost, as it, and add to your belief a brightness, to a brightness knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, endurance, and to endurance, reverence, and to reverence, brotherly affection, to brotherly affection, love. Um, and you talk about how love is an action and not a feeling. Right. Like how do you perform these acts of love to others when, it's, when you're struggling to, because um, of like loving, when you don't really love yourself, when you really don't do these things for yourself. Does that make sense? Like yeah. Not practicing. So All right. So let's go back to something I've taught you guys. And again, you know, you get your life coaching, Torah observance coaching all in the same time. The, the, the first thing you need to do is identify your issues. And so you've just identified an issue, which is a struggle loving yourself. So the next thing you need to do is seek guidance in how to address that. In other words, you need to become an expert in your issue. So learn about self-esteem and how to deal with low self-esteem or, or, or having a, an inability to have self-love and those kind of things. And so you, you get guidance. You can come and counsel with me. I can give you some guidance. We've actually had some of that, right? And then there may be some books you might read or some videos you may watch. And just, you know, learn the things that help you to understand why you struggle with it and then what the pos possible different processes are that you can try to accomplish overcoming the challenge. All right? But you're right. It's going to be hard to love others when you're still struggling to love yourself. Okay? And so, you know, this, this is a very common challenge. 
especially in the women, okay? They have a real challenge with low self-esteem. So don't feel bad. This is very common. It's, it's, it's a real huge problem. And um, we don't have a world that's very good at affirming people. So we end up being torn down by everybody and told we're useless, losers, dumb, this, that, whatever, never accomplish anything, never be worth anything. So it doesn't help that the world is constantly telling you you're not worth anything. And so we have to find that inside of ourselves. And when you can find inside yourself, then it can start to grow. You find that spark. And the, you know, the very beginning of it is to recognize that you were created. And the creator created you because he has a purpose for you and you have value to him. So the highest authority, the highest, greatest being in the universe has an opinion that you have value. So that should be above what anybody else has ever said to you. Now, but you're not believing that so well. But if you can at least believe that one thought and then nurture it and help it to grow, then you can start to find other ways to get value. And then also bring people into your life that will affirm you and express that you have value and appreciate you. Okay, a lot of us have people in our lives that we need to just get out of our lives. Okay, they're just negative, just drawing you down, anchors so that you can't, they're dragging you down and just need to just be not given that much access to you. I don't mean like never talk to them, but certainly limit their access if all they're gonna do is talk negatively and, and not encourage and uplift you. You know, all these coaches out there, these motivational, personal development, life coaching people tell you, you need to get the negativity out of your life. And a lot of that's coming from people that you spend a lot of time with who do not uplift you and encourage you, but tear you down and talk negatively to you and about you. And so you need to have people around you that are gonna say, well, you're not perfect, of course you're not, but you have a potential for perfect and the creator loves you, we love you, we believe in you. You just keep doing it. We're proud of you. You gotta find those people in your life, okay? Yep, that was all, thank you. All right, you're welcome. <laughs> Rob? Okay, from Pete and Brenda Lamb. Um, so does Ephesians 5.11 also mean that we should not remain silent in the face of evil or injustice? Well, the idea of reproving it really is a better translation of being um, exposed or confuted. In other words, you're, you're going to at least know what you're dealing with. So it says, have no fellowship with the fruitless works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And not so much reproving them, meaning you have to go and correct them, but recognize it yourself so that you recognize I don't need to be doing that. Okay? Recognize that you're no longer confused whether or not what they're doing is right or wrong. So you recognize that it's wrong and you shouldn't be involved. However, if you go and, and try to correct those that are not in your authority to correct, you don't have a right relationship for that, it's not going to go well for you or for them and, and bear any fruit for anybody. So let's be careful we don't read that word reprove that way. It's not talking about it that way, all right? It has more the idea of, of exposing, like you've been exposed and recognized that it's something that is wrong, so you do not need to participate in it. Next. Okay, from Greg Wallen, says, uh, Rabbi, how many aspects do you think there are to a person? Does the recipe in 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7 work on increase in Yeshua likeness in all those aspects. Look, like anything else that I've talked about, and you can hear you know, anybody out there doing any kind of training and teaching about life, you could always break life down into different types of processes and different categories. This is one of them that Peter's talking about. And there are other ones that we can look at, like the one that was quoted, um, I think Brianna brought it up, and you know, where it talks about things that are similar, but they're using a slightly different approach. And so they're all good, and they all help, and they all will bear the fruit that they, they claim they will. And so just look at them as all tools in the toolbox, and hopefully at least one or more of them will make sense to you and you'll start applying them. Obviously, the details in, in 2 Peter are not the same details of saying, you know, in Deuteronomy 10, although I can, can, you know, connected them to some degree, right? But Deuteronomy gives a slightly different approach to it. Fear him, 
walk in his ways, love him, serve him. Okay? And so you can look at that process and get the same kind of good results as you would using Peter's. You need both. You need all of those things. So it's just his way of, of addressing the specific issue he thought the people needed to hear out of him. That was his message. And his message was an approach that would eventually lead to love in the right way. Okay? Another one? Okay, I got, yeah, I got, I got, exa- I got two more. Good. Okay, Geraldine Hidalgo, when you spoke about teachers not teaching right or people not doing righteousness, would Luke 22, verses 1 through 14 apply to give the result of that or somewhat related? Luke what? 22, 1 through 14. Okay, so Luke 22 is talking about the Passover, so I'm not really sure. I mean, I mean that's like being, being one of the subjects that they don't teach right? I don't know. I mean, this is one that I cover in Passover Q&A, part two. Um, so anyway, all right. Look, you know, it, it, I don't always know of what's the right way to approach, you know, the idea of other teachers. I know a lot of people hate when I talk about it. And other people appreciate when I talk about it. And I don't think it's a subject that should be ignored. And I just, you know, so I, I do the best I can with it. So I hope you understand that it's a, it's a struggle to know necessarily the right way to deal with it. But as a fiduciary, meaning I have a certain responsibility for you guys, I feel it's my responsibility to at least share some of that information. And I don't do it to attack anybody. I'm disappointed. I wish there would be more of an approach like we talked about earlier. And so I don't accuse. I'm not attacking. I'm not doing any of that stuff. It's just I feel it's very unfortunate that these people come only so far and that's as far as they wish to go. And then they don't go any further. And then the people that they're teaching are only getting incomplete information with still some of the old stuff mixed in. All right, your last one? Last one. There's, this is from Tamara, and then there's several people that, are, uh, that have the same issue and same question. It says, before MTY. By the way, I think it's very wise of you to take your wife as one of the last ones. So <laughs> showing wisdom there as a shamish. Yes, I'm no dummy. Yeah, there you so, go. It says, uh, before MTY, I had never felt love and acceptance. But the love I had felt, love and acceptance I had felt was from some of the, many of the people that have left. And how do I convince myself, how do I convince myself the love was real and, then, and to be able to trust again? Okay. I believe, and I, I tried to adjust this earlier, but I guess I, I didn't really quite, and I'm, I'm not saying that you're not understanding it. I don't think I really addressed it as fully as I could have. I understand and I appreciate Tamara's problem, you know, and challenge, you know, with people that you really start to fall in love with and you, and you feel love from, and then they leave, and then what do you do with that? I believe that love was expressed as genuinely as they were capable of at that time. So I wouldn't take it as being phony, necessarily, depending on the level, on the level of relationship you had. Some people you have a much more deep relationship with, others a more shallow relationship with, you know. I mean, I know pretty much everybody in the room. I don't have a very close relationship with most of you because I just haven't gotten to spend much of that amount of time with you. And so, you know, that's why I say I've got a lot of people that I'm friendly with. I don't have very many friends that I'm actually, the way I would define it as being that close with, okay? Because I've had people say, I thought I was your friend. Well, The way I define it is a little bit different. I only have one or two or three of those, although there are those that I'm closer to and more friendly with than others who I don't know as well, okay? But there's a certain trust relationship to me saying that you and I are friends and we can rely on each other in a certain way. And so these people that you're talking about, I'm sure a lot of them had a genuine love. What's not there was the fullness of what love is supposed to be. Hopefully, did that kind of connect for everyone? They did it the best they could. Think of it like a Christian, okay? Christians understand that there's a God, understand there's a Messiah, and they're doing it the best that they can with what they have, even though it's not fully correct. 
but they are genuine, and you were too when you were there, in trying to do what you could to worship the creator of the universe as you understood at the time. Well, I think these people that were here that you were friends with and that you loved them and they loved you were as genuine as they could be at that time, et cetera, et cetera. And then when the real test of love came, which is when things get challenging, it expressed where they really were at that point. That's not an attack on them. It just exposed that level of where they were. All right? You're not going to really know. This is why, go back and listen to the baptism of fire teaching. I mean, I gave you a lot of teachings to reference today. You know, the baptism of fire is to show you that you grow up to a point, and then you have to have a fire experience to see just how far you've come. People leaving here is a fire experience for them and for you. You know? And, and that's always the case. And then you, it'll test and see, you know, where... It's like a pop quiz. We call it little pop quizzes. It doesn't always feel like a quiz. It feels like a big final exam. But, I mean, it's a pop quiz just to see where you're at. So hopefully that makes sense to me. I, I, you know, don't ever think that the, the love from other people is anything but the love from other people. But when they leave, and if they treat you differently when they leave, or whatever it is that happens... It's just their capacity at that point to handle the fire that they're in at the moment or not handle it. And so don't judge that. Pray for them. Have empathy and sympathy for the fact that this is, they're going through a challenging moment at this point. And so are you. And so this is, hopefully that makes some sense. Okay, and you had one more? That was it? Okay, that was it. Okay, Rocky. No, I'm Wayne. Wayne sat down, so I didn't see him for a second. <laughs> I'm Wayne. I'm addicted to the old man. Wait, wait. Hi, Wayne. <laughs> there you go. All right. Um, a lot of things struck me when we we're going through uh, Second Peter, and um, I just want you to correct me in my my way of thinking. Um, so, starting in verse four, it says, "Through these there have been given promises, so that through these you might be partakers of the most like most like nature." And when I looked at that, and I was like, well, what is the mighty like nature? And I take it as the Torah there, because the mighty like nature from your teaching, the understanding of Ruach is the essence, the spirit, which is the word, which is the Torah. So partakers of the Torah have an escape from the corruption in the world caused by lust. So in order to escape the corruption, well, first I'll go to this, caused by our lust, so I have lust, you said, those are our desires. And I, and I saw that desires is our heart, it's our emotions. So to escape the corruption of our hearts is through Torah. So it made me look at, look at myself that way and remember what um, Rocky said before, where I had the mikvah of my heart right. in order to and just have the old man die. So that, that brought that to me. And it also um, made me think of two other things. The corruption of the world by, caused by lust, okay, and the desires. It's showing what the world's nature is. This is also, and we can take it that way, okay. the nature of the world. Okay. So we're given well, what Yahweh's nature is compared to what the world's nature is. Also, so we can see it like that. But if you want to apply it to yourselves, It'll be like, um, what I just said before. All right, so look, the, you know, the mighty like nature, okay, it talks about his mighty like power in verse three. This is, Torah observance is to change our nature. There's the nature, the worldly nature, the nature, of the, in other words, the, the spirit of man, and there's the Ruach HaKodesh, the spirit of Elohim, and those natures are non compatible. And we have to choose to change our nature to his nature. Let, let this mind be in you, Philippians 2, 5, right? That's in Messiah. So that's, you're, you're right on. I agree with your comments. So and then I also, I look at it and I see the word escape. Like that's a, that's a one word you really have to look at, escape. So you're really, to escape, you're a prisoner of something. So you're, real, you're a prisoner of your own self-sovereignty. So and it just made me really think deeply into that. And how it's how we were going in, and then it talks about endurance. Uh, how strong that endurance has to be to escape that corruption that's within you. 
Well, you know, it's going to take, and I talked about this in um, a lot of the teachings, I guess, when we got into some of the more the life coaching stuff. You have to watch out for the quit that's still in you. You got to get rid of that quit. See, that's what that endurance is all about. If you still have quit in you, you're not going to get there. You're going to struggle against that quit that, hey, uh, this is too hard, or I just don't think I can do it, or everybody was right, I, I'm, I'm a failure, I can't do it. They got to get rid of that quit. That's what belief is. You know that you know that he called you because you can, not because you can't. And so you can't quit. So, so your battle of endurance is the, you know, I always talk about the different battles, right? The dichotomy between fear and doubt and trust and belief. Well, there's quit and endurance, okay? And so you have one or the other. Now, the endurance is going to be a struggle the more quit there's still in you. And the more you can really strengthen up and get rid of that idea of quitting, the endurance part's not tough at all, Okay? I'll give you an example. I remember doing something one time in a karate class, in martial arts class, many years ago. And the teacher had us stand in a particular fighting stance and wanted to see if we would quit. And just had a stand in it. And a lot of people were struggling, and at some point they would quit. And I simply made a decision in my head that I was not going to quit no matter what, I could collapse, I could pass out, but I wasn't going to quit. My body could quit, but I wasn't going to quit. You see? Because I was okay if the body quit. You know, if my legs gave out on me and I just couldn't hold the position or whatever. But I wasn't going to, because of it hurt or this or that or whatever, quit. You can apply that to any aspect of your life. I'm going to do this and do this and do this. And if something... If my physical body can't do it, well, then that's okay with me. I won't be the reason why I quit because of an emotional or, or, or something like that, a, re a reaction, a choice. I won't choose to quit. But if I pass out, I'm okay with that. You understand? I'm not going to be the one that quits. Now, I didn't know, I don't even remember if I was the last one standing or not, but I, I know that I didn't quit. At some point, I think, well, however many were left, he just said, that's good. But I wasn't going to quit. And there was pain, and it was awkward, and my body was shaking, and whatever it was. And I was okay with that. So I was thinking, that's fine. And that's life. Life's going to be tough that way. And you have to decide. It's worth enduring so that I get to the end. Go listen to that teaching. Endure to receive the crown of life. Endure and receive the crown of life. Is the name of the teaching. Okay, there's another one. I've named like 12 teachings today. Okay? Just go back, go back to 2011 and listen to all of them. All right, all 500 of them. Okay? All right, Wayne? I was going to say that um, that's a great teaching in door to receive the crown of life. Um, you pretty much answered. Um, also, what listen I had. to Cling, Cleave, Hold Fast. Same idea, the holding on. It's, it, they go together. Okay, next. Yeah, I just, want, I just wanted to make sure that what I was thinking matches up to what you're yeah. thinking, because I'm supposed, you told us we're supposed to imitate our teachers and our teachers. And no, you hit so. it right on. That was great. Yeah. And then um, I, I think I missed it or anything, but can you remember what you said about fear? Fear is um, believing. It, be, fear is belief, is an understanding of the all and, and reverence of Yahweh. Well, no, what I talked about was in the fear of Yahweh teaching, we talked about fear being an appropriate awe and reverence and fear to disappoint or let down. Not fear necessarily of he's going to kill me. Although that should be there too because he can. Okay? And even if he doesn't kill you, he could let you actually ultimately just die and then not have another opportunity, not have any opportunity for eternal life. So... But the fear not being the trembling in your boots fear, but the fear because you respect and you have such high levels of awe and reverence for him that you're, you don't want to let him down. Your big thing you're afraid of is him looking at you like, nodding his head, shaking his head at you like, I can't believe you just did that. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, put the camera on me for a second. Okay, so you don't want to see this. Like, why would you do that? You know what I'm saying? That's the look. 
You know, by the way, if you're married, your spouse has done that to you once or twice, you know what that looks like. And it's not a fun look. When they look at you like, how could you do that? A disappointed look. It hurts. It hurts, and it really hurts. Now, of course, it only hurts if you have that proper level of fear, awe, and reverence, okay? So, excellent point, okay? Um, Rocky? Oh, Steve, you got something? Yeah, I was trying to let others, that's how Brianna took one of my questions, but that's still good. I'm glad we're thinking along the same line. I, I was, you talked earlier about appropriate behavior, and, and it said in the you scripture, bring the right up to it said in the scripture, let no one deceive you yet, when it's pointed out that we're being deceived at times, sometimes you get the response from people, well, it's complicated. But to me, that phrase, that phrase, it's complicated, is another way of saying, we don't want to explain what we're doing, even though we know what we're doing, we shouldn't be. Does that make sense? Yeah, I can see how that happens sometimes, sure. And then it's, you said, walked exactly as wise, as uh, walked, Exactly, not as unwise, but as wise. But the wisdom would come from the teachers and the actions we take and then adjustments we need to make in those actions. Yeah? Exactly, yes. And then you did say that love is more than, love includes discipline, which a lot of people seem to miss, correction and adjustment. And then talk about choice, the choices we make to, to covenant, it's not a one-time thing. It's an every day, all the time, ongoing. I mean, absolutely. Okay, thank, Brian. Thank you. I'll be quick. I wanted to touch on um, what you and Shane were talking about with the whole self-love and self-esteem thing because that's something I've always struggled with. And a while back, um, as I was praying and meditating on that, a thought occurred to me, and it really gave me a lot of perspective. And I hope it'll help others as well. But we serve a limitless and all-powerful Elohim. He could have created an infinite amount of worlds. He could have created an infinite amount of people, but he didn't. He created the heavens and he created the earth. And over the course of human history, there have been, what, maybe a hundred billion people that have ever lived. Out of the context of infinity, that's nothing. That's infinitesimal. The fact that we're even alive, that he chose to create each of us as individuals, is a miracle. The fact that you're alive and he's allowed you to come into the belief of the creator is an even greater miracle. The fact that you're in this room and believe all those things and are here and he's given you the truth that the Torah is the way to live, that's one of the greatest miracles of all. Amen. Amen. Well said. Listen, you know, most of the room, most of the people here have moved here to be here. And I'm sure most of you did not ever think you would be moving to Tennessee. But that's, but that's, that's where you know that his hand has been in something that you're in because this isn't what you were thinking. I just can't wait to, when I get to a certain point in my life, I'm just move to Tennessee. It, you know, it just wasn't, I didn't think I'd ever end up in Tennessee, okay? And I've been here twice. <laughs> Okay, and so, but it's, it's one of those things. All right, so that's gonna wrap it up. Okay.